Good evening. Welcome to Seattle Community Church's online worship on this Good Friday. My name is Pastor Brenna, and I am so honored that you are joining with us tonight as we journey with Jesus to the cross and his death and into the uncertainty and darkness that Good Friday brings. This evening, if you were able to gather seven candles before the service, we invite you to light those now. Feel free to dim or turn out the lights in your home and prepare your heart as we get ready to encounter Jesus and the cross. This evening, you will hear the seven last words of Jesus. You'll be invited to join us as a community in prayer and to extinguish those candles in your own living room as we move closer and closer to the darkness. After a long and hard year, each of us is invited this evening to keep awake, to stay with Jesus in his journey to the cross and beyond. Friends, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Let us join together in the call to worship. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. He was despised and rejected by others, wounded for our transgressions. Light of the world. Light of the world, you step down in.
Let us join together in a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come to worship you tonight. In our worship, we ask that your spirit will come upon us, that we may be able to see you, and that we may be able to see ourselves as we are. Lord, help us that we may not see ourselves to be more than we are, but as broken people in need of your grace and healing. In our worship tonight, help us that we may recognize what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us, that in his pain and suffering, that we have healing, and that it is through his sacrifice that we have once again become your children. Lord, help us to reflect tonight upon our need of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. The first word, Luke 23, 13 through 38. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people. And here I have examined him in your presence, and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. And they all shouted out together, Away with this fellow! Release Barabbas for us! This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! And a third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. And I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. And so Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder, and he handed Jesus over as they wished. As they led him away, they seized the man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this, when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by, watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was also an inscription over him, saying, This is the king of the Jews. Loving Father, to whom your crucified Son prayed for the forgiveness of those who did not know what they were doing, grant that we too may be included in that prayer. Whether we sin out of ignorance or intention, be merciful to us and grant us your acceptance and peace in the name of Jesus Christ, our suffering Savior. Amen.
The second word. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. O Lord Jesus Christ, who promised to the repentant the joy of paradise, enable us by the Holy Spirit to repent and to receive your grace in this world and in the world to come. Amen. The scripture comes from John chapter 19, 17 to 21, the third word. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. 
There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews. But this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who gets it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing, they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciples took her into his own home. O oh, blessed Savior, in your hour of greatest suffering, you expressed compassion for your mother and made arrangements for her care. Grant that we who seek to follow your example may show our concern for the needs of others, reaching out to provide for them who suffer in our human family. Hear this, our prayer, for your mercy's sake. Amen. The fourth word from Matthew 27, 45 to 49. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Ali, Ali, lamas bakhtanai. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling out for Elisha. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge and they filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see if Elijah will come and save him. Join me in prayer. O oh Lord, I call for help by day, and in the night I still must cry. Regard me. Listen to my prayer. My soul is troubled. I am weak, cut off as one whom you forsake, forgotten near the pit of death. Your wrath weighs heavy on me here. Your angry waves upon me break. Friends watch in horror from afar. I am shut in without escape. My eyes are dim because I weep. My hands are lifted up to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Can graves tell out your mighty deeds? There, who can know that you can save? Lord, do not hide your face from me. You have afflicted me from youth. Your anger is destroying me. Your flood of anger closes in. The darkness is my closest friend. Shunned and forsaken. All alone. Amen. What do we do? with this painful passage? What do we do with this painful day? This Good Friday, what is good about this day? What is good about the brutal murder of the Son of God? What is good 
about the cry of abandon that falls brokenly from the lips of Jesus. This day and this particular passage are often pushed to the margins in the American church. Give us Monday, Thursday with communion and foot washing and the promise of what is to come or bring on Easter with the brightly colored eggs, the hallelujahs and the lilies. But Good Friday, with its sense of hopelessness and desperation and bleakness, no thank you. There is no good there. This particular passage the church likes to avoid, disliking the implication that Jesus felt abandoned, disliking even more the notion that God may actually have, in fact, abandoned Jesus. And so we stretch it every conceivable way with every imaginable theory, our favorite and most common being that while Jesus felt abandoned by God, God was in fact still present, just hidden from his view for a time. And I have to wonder, I wonder, though, that for the person or the people who feel abandoned, what difference is there between the actual absence of God and the perceived absence of God? For a person or a community in the midst of pain and suffering, perceived absence is equivalent to the real absence of God. In fact, it might even be worse. Because if God is there and simply watching us suffer, how do we begin to process that? And that is why, my friends, this passage and these days are good. Because as Jesus hangs there alone on the cross, as God allows God's self to fully experience the heartbreaking why, all of the sudden God becomes much more trustworthy to you and to I. Because here is God walking this mortal and this human road knowing its cost and its pain and its fear and uncertainty. Here is God telling us that our pain and our suffering are not to be walked through alone. That there is one who can understand, who is with us, watching with us, not from afar, but pressed up close. In this same passage in Mark, as Jesus shouts out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A soldier looks on. And it is his death that draws the soldier in. Surely this is the Son of God, he says, as he watches Jesus on the cross. In the Gospel of Mark, in fact, it is the first time that a human being will declare Jesus to be the Son of God. Not in those moments of glory, not in the miracles that he puts forth, but instead in his suffering and in his death, the true nature of God is finally revealed. We cannot know what was going on in Jesus' mind as he hung upon the cross, but perhaps we can, in fact, get a little bit of insight. Jesus, the Jesus who in so many ways embraced sorrow and hope throughout the course of his life in one moment, cries out in lament. But it is a lament that is tinged by hope. Because this lament that he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It comes from Psalm 22, and I encourage you to read it, to see that it goes not just into a place of desperation, but it ends in a note of hope. 
And in a moment, as Jesus hangs there on the cross, he reveals to the world, to you and to me, that this pain and these questions that we face in our life, they are okay. In fact, they are what make us human. And when the people around us that we love or us face pain and loss, when we question or rage or accuse, we should not, in fact, be afraid. We should not tell others to be quiet or to stop asking why. Too often, We shut people down when their cry of abandonment rings out. We see it as a sign of disbelief and it scares us. So maybe this is the greatest lesson that Jesus ever teaches. That faith is not felt. It is not dependent on emotions or experiences of joy. Rather, faith is the choice of a heart to believe to long for God in the midst of doubt and pain and challenges, not in the absence of them. To choose in spite of everything else, everything that the world will tell us when all evidence tells us that we are alone and abandoned, to choose to believe that God is there. And it is in this response, the mingling of sorrow and hope and faith and doubt on the cross, that is what leads to the soldier's confession, surely this is the Son of God. In the end, it's not the miracles or the power or the glory. It is the pain. It is the all-too-human cry of why combined with a holy trust of God that speaks to the heart of the soldier at the foot of the cross. That perhaps reveals to him in that moment something that speaks so deeply, so fundamentally to being human that his heart could no longer deny the truth. It is the cry that reveals to him the love of one who would subject themselves to the most horrible pain and the ultimate of human sacrifice and the deepest questions we have, the feelings of abandonment and the pain of limited knowledge, the devastation of feeling left behind by a loved one so that we might be saved. In the face of loss and death, we do not need a victorious Jesus. We need the Jesus we know on the cross, the one who feels our pain, who echoes our questions. We need to know that we have a God who understands us and our struggles. It is that God that we can lean on. It is that promise that will help us make it through each and every pain we endure. In the famous poem, an old astronomer to his pupil, the dying teacher tells his student, though my soul may set in darkness, it will rise in perfect light. I have loved the stars too fondly to be fearful of the night. It is my hope, my friends, on this good, good Friday that we will discover that we have loved God far too fondly to be fearful of the darkness that Friday invites. With every candle that we blow out, We see not the abandonment of God, but the presence of God all around us, stronger with us in the dark. The cry of the cross is not one of faithlessness, but one of faith 
that surpasses all human understanding. It is the cry of faith from the soul. One gives us hope that we too may know God. It frees us to be human and it promises us that no matter how dark it may get, that we are never ever alone. Amen. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me tremble. find my Lord were you there when they nailed him to the tree were you there when they nailed him to the tree oh, 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 oh sometimes it causes me tremble comes from John 19, 28 through 29. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. O blessed Savior, whose lips were dry and whose throat was parched, grant us the water of life, that we who thirst after righteousness may find it quenched by your love and mercy, leading us to bring the same relief to others. Amen. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, you finish the work that you were sent to do. Enable us by your Holy Spirit to be faithful to our call. Grant us strength to bear our crosses and endure our sufferings, even unto death. Enable us to live and love so faithfully that we also become good news to the world, joining your witness, O oh Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That he should give his only A wretch is treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. 
the father turns his face away as wounds which hurt the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man The seventh word. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus crying with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for the spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. Father, into whose hands your Son, Jesus Christ, commended his Spirit, grant that we too, following his example, may in all of life and at the moment of our death, entrust our lives into your faithful hands of love. In the name of Jesus, who gave his life for us all. Amen. the cross at 
the cross. He died for our sin at the cross. He gave us life again. I know a place, a wonderful place where I can. Love.